We've been talking about uh, the subject of uh, being holy, and uh, the title of it is Grace to be Holy, and we have had grace, and we have looked at a theme verse in the book of Titus chapter 2, which we're not going to uh, go there in the book of Titus uh, tonight. We talked about 2 Timothy last week, about if we purge ourselves of these things, uh, talking about purging, talking about uh, pruning ourselves, we can be a vessel unto honor, able for the master's use. And so to be to uh, God, God's word, grace is what makes us there, but we have a responsibility to keep ourselves right before God. Uh, the Bible talks about those without a strong voice of leadership, or it says without revelation, uh, or actually, if you look at the King James says, without, without a vision, the people perish. Uh, the new King James in the original text of it said, without a revelation, the people cast off restraints. So it didn't say that God had anything to do with it. Without people walking in the revelation of God's word, those people will cast off restraints. I've watched people cast off restraints I never thought would ever cast off restraints. I've watched, I mean, sometimes I've thought these people, some people are literally losing their mind when it comes to how to walk with God anymore. And the truth is you just got to decide make a quality decision that I will walk with God. Now, I will reiterate a few things that I've said in the past that I want to make sure we understand. Holiness is not about the outward appearance, even though though the Bible does speak about our appearance. It does speak about how we do things in modesty and different things. It has nothing to do with how short, well, maybe how short, uh, things are, how long things are when it comes to dress and clothes and sleeves or hair, but it's about the heart. Amen. It's about the heart and different things. So we want to make sure we keep that in perspective. And at the same token, uh, there are, there are things, uh, I've said this, uh, many times, but you got to watch how you say it because people will try to miss, you know, uh, misrepresent what you say or different things as such. But, even in our dress, we don't need to do things to just bring attention to ourselves. We don't, we don't need that. So that's not, being, that's not being judgmental or putting people into bondage. Uh, I, I, I told Maddie and Brittany both, uh, back when they were both little girls, I said, uh, uh, boys are stupid. Of course, they said, we know that. But boys are stupid. They just literally believe... If you're willing to show it, you're willing to share it. Boys are that way. But how many knows a lot of people's that way? So there is some things that we don't do because it's just not right, regardless of values. Am I right? So that's just free things for you. Uh, But I wanted to tell my daughters that when they were young because this is why we do that because we don't want boys to think uh, she's all right to show it, so... Maybe she's all right to do other things. And uh, so these are, this is, a, this, is a, this is a church. We ought to be able to talk about these things. This is how we raise families. Amen? You're looking at me like, <gasps> is he talking about this? Is there a verse for that? There's all kind of stuff for that. And uh, there is a things about modesty that we do. All right? So, uh, so we teach our young boys what's right, and we teach our young girls what's right. Amen? That's what we do. But we're not just talking about this because it's a bondage thing. We're talking about it because it's part of our walk with God and a part of a term we call sanctification. Amen. It's a part of what we call sanctification on this. All right. Go with me uh, to the book of St. John chapter 17. Going to start with a different verse tonight. Uh, We have read these verses on different occasions and brought different things out. Uh, I didn't go back and look at it, but... Uh, I'm reminded in my heart, it wasn't long ago that I referred to these verses. I don't know if I read them, but I referred to these verses here. And so I want to look at it, uh, starting here at first John, I mean, St. John chapter 17, verse six, let's start at verse six. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known all 
they, they, they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. And you have given them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. Now this is all, now notice this is all written in red. This is the time that Jesus prays. He's praying. Now he's talking here. He says, these are things that he's doing. This is his prayer. People talk about the prayer of Jesus and the book of John. This is it. This is the prayer. And he said, I pray for them. So he's not just talking to them. I pray for them. Do not pray for, for the, he said, for I pray for them. I do not pray for the, for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now, I'm no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I've come to you, Holy Father. So, so who did he just come to? Holy Father. I've come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. Verse 12 now. While I was with them in the world... I kept them in your name. Now, this is how Jesus operated with his men. While I was with them in the world, I kept them through your name. Those whom you've gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. And who was that? Judas, that, that denied him. 13, but now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word. How many knows that's a priority? That was a priority of the living word in the earth called Jesus. I have given them your word. Now I'm reading all of this because I wanted, I wanted to grasp something here to help us. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Let me tell you, if, if they hated them then, the world is not going to just love you now. If the world just loves you so much, then maybe you need to find out why they love you so much. Because the world did not love Jesus that way, and the world did not love his disciples that way, because it was contrary to their lifestyle. Even the demons didn't like him. Have you come to torment us before our time? So you have to understand that just because the world doesn't like you doesn't mean you have to turn around and try to gain favor with the world. Come on. Thank you for the three head bobs and the two that's right. But the truth is, and a couple amens, but the truth is you don't have to please the world. You keep pleasing God. Amen. Amen. Verse 15, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. Now, here it is. Oh, God, just, 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 just get us out of this mess. Hey, Jesus didn't pray to take them out of the world. Watch this. I did not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. So while we're in this world here, that we have the ability, as Jesus prayed to the Father for the disciples, that he will keep us from the evil one. Amen. It's like I mentioned a few weeks ago when I started this, I believe it was, uh, that many people have said, you know, I don't want to work around. I don't want to work around heathens anymore. I want to work around all Christians. Well, if you work around all Christians, I found out that ends up being strifle at times. So just because you're working around all Christians doesn't mean that life is going to be better because the grass always looks greener on the other side. But if the light leaves the darkness, then the darkness is on its own. Somewhere you have to understand in the midst of darkness, you can still be a light, but you do not have to participate in their darkness for them to see your light. You continue to be the light. Amen. I, I, don't, I don't believe the, I don't pray for the rapture just because I have an escape theology. Get us out of here, oh God. No, I want God to show up and prove himself to be God. God does judge sin and the world. I just want God to show up and be God. And if you hear some Christians, oh, just get us out of here. 
I'm not interested in just going to get us out of here because I've got loved ones I don't want to see go to hell. I'm still believing for those who need to be born again to get born again. And if we take out all the salt, nobody's going to be thirsty for God anymore. Come on. And if you're just always around Christians, 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 and you're just going to keep making one Christian salty, that's how you get salty. But salt makes people thirsty and hungry. Now, we ought to be salt to one another. We ought to help make people thirsty and more hungry for the things of God. But you ought to be able to affect the world that way. That salt makes people thirsty. They may not act like they're thirsty. But when you walk out of the room, I mean, they're grasping for something. And they just don't know. But salt will make people thirsty. So we have to understand we're not in this escape mentality. I want the rapture so we can get us out of here because I'm too weak and frail. I can't stand this little world because I don't want it to beat me. It's not going to beat me and it's not going to beat you. Rise up, almighty ones. And push back the darkness and let the glory of the Lord be risen. Come on. Read 15 again. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. How many knows we're in this world, but we're not of this world? They are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them by your word. Your word is truth. Now, sanctify them. We're going to see this word again. We talked about sanctification. We talked about different things as such. But he said, sanctify them through thy word. Now, here's the thing. If you try to live a sanctified life separated from the word of God, you are failing. Because no word, no faith, no word, no sanctification, no word, no wisdom, no word. Let me give you some good English. No, nothing. No word, when you take the word out, it leaves the void in every other place. See, the enemy tries to occupy people and get us so caught up to where the word of God only becomes something taking place in the church. But we cannot allow the word of God to be that which takes place here. If it is, then we have made it a tradition and not a life. The word's got to dominate our life everywhere we go. It's got to dominate our speech. It's got to dominate our actions. It's got to dominate our love walk. He is the word. And that word has got to dominate us in everything. As soon as you do something wrong, it's the truth of God's word in your spirit by the Holy Spirit that gets your heart. That's wrong. You shouldn't do that. That's not condemnation. That's called conviction. You got to understand there's a difference between conviction and condemnation. Oh, you're just judging. You're just condemning me. No, let me tell you, it's not about condemnation. It's about conviction. There is a conviction to live right when you're born again. You don't have to, there's something inside of you. He's called the Holy Spirit and he, the Holy Spirit loves to help you do right. Amen. He loves to help you do right. So uh, he said, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Now the word of God is what? Truth. Your word is truth. And uh, if you want to read how precious the word of God is, uh, you don't want to. uh, I'll tell you the one you want to read is Psalm 119. All right, Psalm 119. Now, if you've committed to read a, a chapter every day and it's 1159 and you're ready to fall asleep and you're thinking, I better go read a psalm. I said I'll read a chapter a day. I better go read one. You might not want to pick Psalm 119 because there's like 178 verses or something in it or something, you know. I mean, it's a massive. So you, you, you want to pick one of them little three-verse psalms. Uh, but you don't want to pick 119. David just talks about 
His love for the word of God. His love for the word of God. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. He just deals with his love for the word. Sometimes I read Psalms 119 just to stir myself up and make myself more thirsty for the word. Because it just deals with the word of God. That's why God said, I found a man after my own heart. He chases my heart because his word. He says, sanctify them through thy truth, for thy word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, huh? he's talking to the Father, and for their sakes, I sanctified myself. Now, what would the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the the sinless, spotless Son of God, why would he say, for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth? Now, how could he be sanctified? He is the very act of sanctification. The Bible says in Corinthians he is our righteousness, our wisdom, our sanctification. Our, he's everything to us. He's everything. So you got to understand, there was a time that Jesus fasted 40 days and afterwards he was hungry. The Satan, Lucifer, not just one of his little prince demons, came to him and said, if thou be the son of God, command these stones, hungry one, to be be made bread. Jesus said, I separate myself from those lies. It is written by the word of God, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Through thy truth, I have proved to live a separated life from the lies of the enemy, from the, from the deception of the enemy. Jesus had more opportunities The enemy tried to trip him up, but the truth, God's word, he said, I only say the things that I hear him say. I only do what I see him do because that truth kept a sanctification in his life, a separation. No, it's not a sanctification like we look at it, like we're we're, we're born again and we're having flesh issues and different things like that, but we're constantly walking in a sanctification, a separation from sin, a separation from the world, separation from lustly desire, separation from that. We're not dealing with that kind. Jesus didn't deal with that kind of sanctification because he was without sin. He who knew no sin became sin that we might be made the righteous of God. But this works in us. It's a separation. But Jesus said, I'm not allowing anything. No sickness, no disease, no disaster, nothing. I keep myself. It's the truth of God that keeps myself. He is the example how the word of God separated him from all this junk. For their sakes, I sanctified myself. Now, the word of God is a sanctifying issue. It's not just your prayer life. I want to pray and pray that I never fall. Well, you may fall. Because prayer may not be what it is to keep you there. I know a lot of people that pray diligently, that are very, very faithful with prayer, but still have a very weak walk with God. Because faith doesn't come by praying. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. It's a fact. I know people that pray and still carnal. They've just developed a discipline of prayer. But they, but, but they, they, uh, they talk like, I don't know why God still doesn't. I don't know where God's at. But they pray all the time. Because faith doesn't come by prayer. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. And the more words you have in you, the better you pray. Because you'll pray more of the word when you're praying. Now, when you're putting yourself, when you got the word going in your spirit and it's become alive to you, now you're praying the word of God. Now, prayer is working because of the word of God and faith. You can fast all you want, but prayer does, faith doesn't come by fasting. Faith doesn't come by praying. Praying is important. Fasting is important. But faith comes by hearing the word of God. You've got this, the word of God that separates us from all things. See, what, how I put it before, when it comes to a disease, sickness, and different things. See, we have to get our mind renewed. We, 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 we can say things like, 
You know, I don't know why things doesn't happen when God's provided it all. Right, right, right. I understand God provided it all. But you still have to deal with you. You still have to deal with you. It's still got to get through to you or less. It's just a supernatural manifestation of God. Contrary to your faith in the laws of nature. God still has to get to you through you. That means he's got to get through your mind. He's got to get through your reason. There's things that you've got to get past to get to it. So we can say things like, you know, I, I, you know when are we going to see this? Or when are we going to see that? Well, uh, the only thing you have control of is you. And if you, 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 you do it right now, we have a corporate explosion. But even I can't control what you do at home, how you talk. Because most people talk different around me than they do at home. Most people live different around me or act different around me when I'm there. Your kids, if they're teenagers, if they got buddies that are influencing them, boys or girls, how they talk with them is not how they're going to talk around you. But eventually they'll slip. So the truth is your kids will talk different around you. And the truth is people will talk different when they come in here. Amen. They'll talk different coming here because we learn how to talk Christianese and uh, we get good at it. And, uh, but out there we learn how to talk world. And a lot of people are bilingual Christianese, and worldly please. They please the world, but they have the language in here. So you can't do that. You, you, you can't do that. So you are, you are your greatest threat. You get me? You are your greatest threat. And if you deal with you, and you take care of you, and you, and you renew you mine and you keep you heart right, and you keep the unity right in you, let me tell you, God will always fulfill his part. God will always fulfill his part. But I had a guy tell me one time, I know who your problem is. I said, who was it? He says, the one you shave every day. He's right. Because I'm, I am my biggest threat it's not people from the outside because I don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Nobody should keep me out of the will of God, but I can keep myself out of the will of God. Come on. Nobody should keep me out of the blessing of God, but I keep myself out of the blessing of God. Nobody should keep me out of walking in victory, but I can keep myself out of walking in victory. Nobody can pluck me out of the hand of God, but I can sure jump out if I want to. There's something about... I'll do it my way. That gets you in trouble. Amen. What have we said for a long time? The church is not Burger King. You can't have it your way. We got to have it his way for he is the way, the truth, and the life. Come on. Come on. Last time I was in Burger King, I didn't get it my way either. So I don't know why they have that commercial. Uh, anyway, here we go. For their sake, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself. They also may be sanctified. So now we see this sanctification. Sanctification, listen to me, prepares things for God to show up. Every time I started seeing in the Old Testament, when God told Moses and the other people, sanctify the people, it was right before God showed up. When he was getting ready to cross them over to the promised land, he said, sanctify them. That they, that they separate themselves because I'm getting ready to show up. And I love that about God because he will show up. Now, you know, I've heard from a young guy. 
uh, people talking about, I want to see God in the fullness of his glory. I want God to come down in the fullness of his glory. Well, most people wouldn't want that. Because if God showed down in the fullness of God, uh, it would mess with the sin in your life. And you could just, according to the Old Testament, they just drop dead. Because sin could not dwell in the presence of God. So all this stuff about I, w- I wish God would just show up in our church on one Sunday morning and just show up in full power. Uh, I hope he doesn't do that in full power because there may be a few people we carry out. <laughs> that is a Sunday morning sermon. <laughs> I'm telling you because sin cannot live in that kind of glory. I'll show you. All right, go, go, go with me to the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus, chapter 19. Now, if I say first Exodus, you know I've really messed up. The book of Exodus, chapter 19. We're at Mount Sinai here. And um, there's some things that goes on here. Matter of fact, uh, today I read this whole chapter again. And... um, I thought about reading the whole chapter tonight, but I read pretty much the whole chapter of, uh, of John. But chapter 19, let's just kind of lay the groundwork here of what's going on. So let me, I wasn't going to, uh, but let me just start at verse 1 because I just want to. In the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt. So they didn't just leave yesterday, okay? On the same day, they came to the wilderness of Sinai. And they, for they had departed from Rephidim and came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain, camping. And Moses went up to the Lord and the Lord called to him from the mountain saying, thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, Now, we know they were Jacob, right? Because when Jacob had that encounter with God, he was no longer, you know, talking about the the Jacob thing. So he knows he's talking about God's people here. The house of Jacob. And tell the children of Israel. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. Now, how many read what God did to the Egyptians? How many knows you don't want that kind of showing up on, on, on you? Okay. You saw what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings. I like that talk. How I bore you on eagle eagle wings and brought you to myself. Oh, hallelujah. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant. Now, let me tell you, you cannot count the times. I cannot count the times where God brought this to them, if you obey and keep my covenants, obey, keep my statutes. I mean, it's all over. Then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. Peter says a peculiar people. A special treasure of all people. Uh, Just think that God, if God said they could be a special treasure of all people, and that's the weaker covenant, the Old Testament, and we have a better covenant based upon better promises, how much of a treasure are you now? Come on. And you, he said, (laughs) excuse me, a special treasure of of all people for all of, of all the earth is mine. All right. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Say holy nation. nation. Say separated. Separated. Holy. Holy. Those are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. That means you add nothing to it and you don't take anything away from it. These are the, if God said these are the words, then that means you don't use your own. These are the words. So Moses came down, came down and called for the elders of the people and laid before them all these words what the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. I've read that before in here. All we will do. 
So Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. All right, I said it. They heard it and they said, this is what we'll do. So I'm telling you, this is what they said. You can read other places where they did not do what they said they're going to do. But that's not the part of this teaching tonight. All right. And the Lord said to Moses, behold, I, I come to you in a thick cloud for the people may, that the people may hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. So I'm going to show up and I'm going to speak to you and they're going to hear me speak to you. So they're not going to say, he always says God says, but how do we know God says? I'm going to show them. I'm going to speak to you and all the people's going to know and believe you forever. So Moses did. So, so Moses told the, so Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to the people, consecrate them today and tomorrow. Consecrate them, sanctify them, consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. I'm going to come down, but here's how it's going to work. Set bounds for the people all around saying, take heed to yourself that you do not go up into the mountain or touch, touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Do not lay hands or touch. So it's not to put to death. They're just going to die. You remember the man who they had the Ark of the Covenant on a cart and the the ox slipped and there's a man named Uzzah that was going to stable the ark. And as soon as he touched it, what happened? He died. People said, I can't believe God killed an innocent person. God, God did kill an innocent person. They handled the things of God wrongly. You're saying wrongly. He says, this ark shall be carried up on the shoulders of the priest. There shall be staves on both sides of this ark, and priests shall carry this ark, and that's the way it shall be transported. But they built a new cart, and they transported it, and stood at getting holy priests to carry that ark the way it is. And so it wasn't, he didn't die because God just killed him. It said, because this was the presence of God, this housed the presence of God, and it wasn't handled right, and judgment came. See, people understand that there's really a way to do things. There's really a way to do things. So I heard a guy preach one time about this Uzzah and putting the Ark of the Covenant on a cart. And he says, what killed him was new boards and big wheels. Because I said they built a new cart. <laughs> So he's preaching against boards and big wheels in the church. But anyway, that's not the gospel. The gospel was, I liked it, the message. But uh, that's not the way they're supposed to transport the presence of God. How many knows you got to treat the presence of God with reverence? It's simplified. So what happened is he's dealing with that when the presence of God shows up, Tell the people don't touch it. But he said, before my presence shows up, there's something they have to do. Consecrate, sanctify themselves, and wash their clothes. Because I'm going to show up on the third day, and they better be sanctified, consecrated, and clean. Let me tell you, I don't see God ever changing. If he said in the Lord that God, I change not. There's something about being in the presence of God, consecrated, separated, and clean. That's why he said, who shall ascend into the mount of God? Who shall come into this holy hill? Those with clean hands and a a pure heart. So, So when we see this, I started paying close attention to two things. I've talked about this in past. I started paying very close attention to two things. That when the prep, when God's glory is in manifestation, sin gets dealt with very quickly. When it seems like we're not in revival and, and people are in a lackadaisical, backslid state. It's like, when, is, when will this thing ever be judged? 
I've heard old time people say, boy, I remember when God judged things really quick. And then it's like, when will God ever judge this? When will God ever judge this? When will God judge America? When will God judge the church? When will God judge, judge, judge? And I've heard that. But I come to find out studying revivals of old and church history and looking at the word of God, when God was moving and there was revival, when people started messing with it, judgment hit and sin was dealt with. But when it wasn't in revival, you did not see this kind of expedited judgment. You'll take, for an example, you take high priest uh, 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 Oh, my, my mind just went uh, blank on that. Uh, Eli. Eli was a high priest. He had his two sons that were, were just anti-God almost. They mocked God, mocked the house of God. They took sacrifices that wasn't legal to take. They met young girls at, at the temple and went, and went off and, uh, and uh, had their little times with them. And people saying, man, you know, why... How can this keep going on? But God said, I'm raising up a new prophet, a new priest. It was Samuel. It's in the first Samuel chapter three. God said, I'm going to raise up this new one called Samuel. Right in the same house of Levi. Samuel was there. But it said in the first three verses, air King James or before the lamp of God went out in the temple. So in essence, that high priest was over that lamp in that temple. There was no natural light in that first room of that tabernacle. No natural light. You had the courtyard. Then you had beyond the courtyard, behind the first veil. The Bible talks about there's a first veil. Behind that first veil, it was the holy place. Not the holies of holies. In that holy place, there was three pieces of furniture, right? There was the candle, There was the table of showbread and there was the altar of incense, which they put on that altar of incense, which which represented the sweet smelling savor going up before they crossed behind that second veil into what the Bible calls two phrases, the holiest of all or the holiest of holies. Both terms are used. Now, in that first room, the only light was in there was that candle. It's like a candelabra came up. And it was very clear. The day that candle goes out, my presence will depart from the temple. Now, how many knows God's serious about what he says? God's serious. It was the priest's responsibility. Now, he just said in Exodus that you shall be priest unto God. You shall be priest unto God. So it was the high priest's responsibility to make sure that lamp never went out. And you're seeing Eli, it said he was dim in his eyes, not only physically, but it proves to be spiritually. He couldn't see the things of God anymore. Now the lamp of God was getting ready to go out. That same night, the lamp of God went out. How in the world could the lamp of God go out? Because the priest lost track of his responsibilities. Now, the lamp, what kept it going was oil. Oil represents the Spirit of God. When you allow that to weaken in you, the light gets dim. You have a responsibility to stay full of the oil of gladness, full of the oil of the Spirit, because God never intended for his light to go out. But he said, when it goes out, my spirit will depart. So it goes on down there that Eli that night, this is how I preached it because I believe with all of my heart, having a working relationship with the Holy Spirit, I cannot fathom the thought that Eli went to sleep without him being stirred as the high priest. God spoke to the high priest. The spirit of God came upon three people, the prophets, the priests, and the king. Those are the only three people the spirit of God came upon. And so I had have a hard time thinking that God did not try to get Eli's a temple that whole evening. Just like he does you. Eli, check the lamp. <gasps> oh, I'll do it in a minute. Hey, you better get to church. <gasps> oh, well, I'll go next week. You better read your Bible. Oh, I'm tired tonight. 
Eli have checked the lamp. Eli's almost have to be led because he's almost blind. But it's that way spiritually. Eli, check the lamp. Ignore, ignore. I can see Eli going down and laying in his bed that night. And just because God's so good and his grace is so wonderful, his mercy is so rich. Eli, get out of bed, tend to the lamp. Eli didn't do it. For me to think that that lamp went out without the Spirit of God trying to help Eli, I think I couldn't, I don't think I could put those pieces together. Because God's not willing that any should. But Eli didn't do it. And how could the sin go on with these sons? How can the sins go on with these sons? Because the Bible says, let me just read it to you. I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to tell the story. Let me just read it to you. Uh, Go to 1 Samuel chapter 1. Hurry, hurry, hurry. You're taking too much time. Come on. Verse 1. Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare. King James says precious. You know, it's not like you see a little little baby. Chapter 3, verse 1. It's not like you have a little baby, little grandkids. And, uh, and you look at them and say, oh, ain't they precious? You know why they call certain metals precious metals? Because they're rare. We look as precious as, oh, they're so precious. <clears throat> Kiss their little face off. No, precious is rare. And so when you read it, you think the word of God was precious in day. Oh, they loved the word of God so much. No, the word of God was rare in those days. There was no open vision. There was no open spread of revelation. Where there's no revelation, my people cast off restraints. That's why there was so much sin going on. No word, no revelation, no restraints. Are you with me? We're talking about sanctification. We're talking about grace that makes us holy here. No word, no grace, no sanctification, nothing. So the people cast off restraints. Proverbs says that without a vision, the people perish. But it actually says without a revelation, my people cast off restraints. So he said here, the word was rare in those days. There was no open there was no open spread of, of a revelation. So that tells me that no one was even preaching truth anymore. It's even hard to find truth. How many knows when you can't find truth, you're not going to find revival? If you're not going to find truth, you're not going to find conviction. If there's no conviction, nobody's going to deal with sin. But he's going to raise up a new one. And Samuel is going to show up. And God's going to deal with his people through this man Samuel, okay? Now, so where there's no revelation, there's no preaching. There's no judgment. But are we believing God that in the last days, though darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people, the glory of the Lord shall be risen upon us? Are we really believing there's going to be an outpouring of God? Or do we really believe there's going to be a supernatural manifestation of God's glory? Is that what you want to see? I want to see it. So do you know what I feel responsible for? Is making sure that God's people understand there's a grace to make you holy. So when the presence of God shows up, you don't run one way because you become afraid of it. But you run into it because you want to embrace it. That's what I want. Come on. If God starts dealing with people's flesh and sin, if they don't like it, they'll run the other direction. But I want that grace to be holy. Help me, correct me, show me. All right, help me, correct me, and show me. Now, go to uh, Acts. Let's do this. I got about uh, uh, seven minutes, maybe eight, could be nine, but no more than ten. Uh, <laughs> go to Acts chapter five. <laughs> How'd you like that? Say revival. revival. There was such a revival that, uh, like if you go back to chapter 4, it's on the same page on my Bible. Verse 32, Acts four thirty-two. you go back and read it. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart 
and one soul. It looks like revival to me. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. That looked like revival to me. They didn't have the mentality as mine, selfish. When I read these verses, when I read these verses, I think about finding Nemo, those seagulls. Mine, 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 mine. Mine, 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 mine. It's almost like I watched I watched people do that. Instead of giving it mine, 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 mine. And with great power, sound like revival to me. And with great power, the apostles gave witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace, grace that makes you holy. And great grace was upon them all. Not a select, upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked. Oh, that sounds like revival to me. For all who were possessors of land and houses sold them and brought the proceeds Of the things which they sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. There we go. The preacher's always getting the money. No, it had nothing to do with that. And they distributed it to each as everyone had need. That looks like revival to me. Everything I read here, can anybody agree with me? At least grunt or something. And say that looks like revival. Don't it look like revival? It looks like revival. And Joseph, who was also named uh, Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated as son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having lay and sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Can somebody say revival? That's what you see here. But a certain man named Ananias with his lovely wife, such a submitted woman, Named Sapphira, sold a possession. I'll show you she was submitted. She had a chance to save her own life, but she was too submitted to the deception of her husband. Man, you better lead it right. And he gave back, he, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. So, we, we, this, is our, this is our commitment. This is our pledge. We're going to sell and give it all. But all of a sudden, this spirit began to mess with it. Who would know how much you got for it? You said all, but who knows what all is? All is not always all. It's all you want to give. You know things, how they work. You know things like it's on a need-to-know basis and you just don't need to know. You know all kinds of things like that. What's all? They got deceived. This is revival. Say revival. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and keep back part of the price of the land? Could you, could you, would you like to see his face when Peter said that? <gasps> we call it busted, right? While it remained... While it was yours, was it not your own? While it remained, was it not yours? And after it was sold, was it not your, in, in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? Conception comes by intimacy. Why did you allow this lion spirit to become, why did you become intimate with this lion spirit? Why did you romance it? Why didn't you just reject it? You can see this in your heart. You have not lied to me, to man, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words because of revival and the fullness of God, fell down and breathed his last breath, or like we like to say, just gave up the ghost. Come on. Now, it didn't happen to Eli's boys. They were stealing stuff from the treasury. They were taking stuff. But say revival. Let me tell you. The reason why we have grace to be holy, because we want to be right in the midst 
when God shows up and not have any reservations to what God wants to do in our life. Amen. I don't want to live holy so somebody can say he's holier than thou. Matter of fact, you're talking about thou. I'm not holier than thou. It's thou that's helping me become holy. Come on. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. I want his will done in my life. Amen. I want clean hands and a pure heart. I don't want to confuse my children, my grandchildren. I don't want to confuse my leadership, my staff. I don't want to confuse them about how I live. I don't want that. And you don't need that in your family. You don't need that in your, your marriage. You don't need that in your kids. All you need to do is keep an honest heart, keep a pure heart and clean hands. If you're wrong, admit you're wrong. Repent and get it over with and get back serving God together. Amen. Amen. You're, you're not going to, if you're trying to please the world, you're not going to be pleasers of God. Just please God. All right. Let's finish this little narrative. He fell down, breathed his last breath. So great fear came up all those who heard these things. And young men rose up, wound him up, carried him out and buried him. Now it was about three hours later. Still in church. Doesn't pastor know it's almost 12 o'clock? He's just getting started. Three hours later, still in church. Can you say revival? (laughs) This is how you know you're in revival. When you're three hours, we don't know when it started. We just know the offering time is when he came to the offering. We don't know when it started. Three hours after, after he died, three hours after he died, they were still in church. Woo, revival. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter answered her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, yep, 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 that's it. That's the price. That's what we sold it for. Peter said, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. And immediately, how'd you like to be in that church service? Folks, it's not just a false story. This is real. Immediately, she fell down at his feet and breathed her last breath. And the young men came in and found her dead and carried her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear, say reverence. Great reverence came upon all the church. And upon all who heard these things. And through the hands of the apostle. Many signed and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord. In Solomon's porch. Can anybody say revival? When there's revival. It seems like God deals with things really quick. Why? Because he doesn't want to disrupt it. That's why he said. Through the apostle Paul to the church of Corinth. There is a man among you. Who is, who is committing fornication with his father's wife. Must have been a stepmother. And he said, this, there's a sin about this. It's not even named amongst the heathens. But he said, I've already judged this thing in my heart. When we come together, we're going to turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. That his soul may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, don't you know a little leaven leavens the whole lump. It's time to cast out the old leaven that you become a new lump. He said, if we let this go on, it's going to spread like leaven. And then next thing you know... It's out of control. We cannot allow this kind of lifestyle. We've got to keep God first place in this house. Amen. There's a grace to be holy. It's not to, it's not to be uh, bound. It's not a thing of control. It's something that opens us up. The sanctification, the separation for God to show up in our life. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, let's stand together.